Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. Are we going to Metatopia soon? So soon. Ah, uh, then it must be time for a grab bag. And welcome to another episode of Panda Talking Games. I'm one of your playtesting hosts, Phil. And I am your other playtesting host, Senda. And, well, for tonight's topic, we are gearing up to go to Metatopia, which means that our recording schedule is, as usual, jumbled and mixed up and sort of chaotic. So that makes it the perfect time for a grab bag episode where we answer a few of the shorter questions that you have asked us. Yeah, and what this means is that um, for this episode and the next episode, we're going to be doing grab bags. And then the episode after that will be our Metatopia recap. Yep. So let's get this grab bag started. Phil, what is our first question? Jade Prophet on Twitter asks, what are the pros and cons of running licensed games? Star Wars, Dresden Files, and Firefly are just a few that come to mind. Uh, I'll add one on to that, uh, Jade Prophet. Uh, Marvel in all of its incantations. Oh, man, yes. So cool. For people who don't know, when we do grab bag episodes, we don't actually uh, do no notes. notes for these. Woo! <laughs> so let's uh, let's spitball this. Let's talk about pros first. What are the pros of running licensed games? Um, I think uh, w- the big major pro is that you have a very developed world, universe, etc. to play canon. in. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So you like have this cool layer of canon. Um, you know how everything works. You don't have to start from scratch. And there's a good possibility that other people hopefully will know or be familiar with those licenses, right? So again, you're not starting from scratch. It's really easy to get everybody on the same page about what kind of game you're running. Because, you know, if I say Star Wars or I say Firefly, right? Like that's a specific type of game experience, right? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I'm 100% with you. I think that I think that the two things that you just mentioned, both canon and the draw of an established world, are probably the two biggest reasons people yeah. get into into these games. Uh, I think there's um, I think one, another part is a bit of oh, I don't know the right word for it, but you're getting to play out your fantasies. I mean, yeah. that's what all of role playing is. But I think like specifically, like if you are playing the canon characters, like it is your chance to be. You know, it might be your chance to be Black Panther. You right? get to or, fanfic your own table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's definitely some value. Like, there's <laughs> definitely some value in that, right? Like, some like there are people who really, there real there are people who really enjoy that. Now, there are also people who enjoy playing in that universe, but don't want to play the characters. Yeah, which is actually me because I'm always like, I don't feel like I will do this justice in an improvised kind of way. I, 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 I get agree. imposter I, syndrome. <laughs> I agree. It's actually not my inclination to play the exact characters. I, I like to play in universes, but uh, not the exact characters. So, like, if I was going to play um, the new Star Trek game, I would, you know, from Modiphius, I would definitely make my own crew my own ship. Right. Yeah. And that would, like, absolutely without a doubt. Like, I would never consider playing, like, Picard in the Enterprise or anything like that. Like, would never do that. Right. I've 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 been in a game where we played the actual Firefly crew. It was very difficult for me. Yeah. I, I it, it's hard. Some people are probably really good at this. I just am not one of them. It's hard for me to jump in and just based on like my memories of a television series try to make assumptions about how to act in that character's way totally with you yep and like some characters are easier than others to do that with but like there's we talked last time i think it was last time about character competency versus player competency right and this is one of those times that that happens a lot because if you jump in like i i think i was playing um oh no what's her name the adorable one who takes care of the ship um, Kaylee, uh, Kaylee, yeah, Kaylee, Kaylee. Kaylee. Uh, sorry, my brain isn't working super well. <laughs> so I was playing Kaylee and like, she has a, a, a very bubbly personality, right? But she's also got like undercurrents of all sorts of other things happening. And it's difficult 
to then feel like you necessarily have the, or for me it was difficult to feel like I had the room to like just jump in and expand and create a character from that basis because she's already a very well-developed character. And I was like, I might be doing it wrong. Yeah. Right? Which is a weird thing. So I guess that's a con that is tied into a pro. (laughs) <laughs> well, and I think that I'll 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 play off of that to talk about one of the other cons, right? So one of the other cons of this is um, that um, these kind of games may attract the um, the kind of person who uh, is the super fan. Yes. So um, this is one of the things I was thinking about too. Yes. Right. This is the kind of person who's like you know who like can't who bristles um, if you don't get if you don't get every detail. Uh, of the world right like no that is not where the tholians you know that is not where the tholian space is located like you knob like so it it can be a lot of pressure to play in a canon that has like a heavy fandom like a heavy I think, fandom like, and in a vast universe, because if you have a heavy fandom mixed with a vast universe, the heavy fandom knows all of the details of that vast universe. And that is a lot of information for you to absorb as a GM. Yeah. Like there are some there are some games that are worse than this than others, right? Like so Star Wars has some really heavy fandom and a pretty well defined and you know, universe, and even more so if you um still allow the um the expanded universe into it or whatever. But then I think there are other ones like, so I'll, I'll say this and I think some people will disagree, but I'm okay saying it. So then there's other ones like Marvel where yes, there's like a hugely established um, canon, but comic books are so convoluted by restarting and doing things over and whatever, whatever that like that canon is more malleable. Plus comic books, very, um, especially if we're talking about Marvel, right? Marvel has universe designations. So one could easily say, oh, we're playing, we're playing Marvel, but we're not playing 616, which is the comic book universe. Yeah. So now once you do that, like you are allowed to, you are allowed to kind of bend whatever pieces you want because you're like, yeah, but that's how it happened in this universe. Right, Right, exactly. I totally Uh, just finished a a superhero game and literally one of the tropes that we played into was the like the multiverse, right? Oh, yeah. I I mean, I love I love multi I I love multiverses and stuff. And I actually love that Marvel has designated theirs with, uh, with, you know, with a numbering system. Yeah, Um, I'm going to give another con real quick um, so that we don't dwell too long on this question. Let me give a, a pro and a con from a publishing side. Yeah. All right. So the pro from a publishing side of this is that access to one of these licensed games gives you access to the licensed artwork. Um. Which means that um, these books tend to be gorgeous. Yeah. Right. They, I very rarely do you see a, um, very rarely do you see a licensed product not look amazing. Okay. The con to this is that it is a licensed product, which means that the IP creator is still holding the license to it. Uh, and that means they get a say in a number of things. They get a say in how much money they make. They get a say in how long you get to keep the license. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they get a say in some editorial parts of the game uh, mechanics. So, for instance, uh, in the Marvel Super Heroes role-playing game, in the latter two versions, Saga and Heroic, there was no character creation rules. Marvel didn't want you to make your own superheroes. They only wanted you to play their superheroes. And so Saga wound up having to, uh, Saga wound up creating or uh, designing character creation, but it wasn't in, it wasn't a core game. I'm pretty sure it wasn't core game if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that it came later. But Heroic also did not encourage you. I think it had some rules for how to make a a character, but it wasn't like a full, like it wasn't like other superhero games that had like a full array of mechanics for creating your characters. Right. And that was part of Marvel's deal. The other part of this is, right, is that um, books sometimes have to go uh, back to back to the publisher um, mm-hmm. for editing, which makes yeah. the development cycle much longer. Yep. And then lastly, at some point the uh, license holder may pull the license. Yep. And they can. Um, and, and, and they can. And that's what happened to Marvel Heroic, right? Marvel Heroic just stopped one day. 
Like yeah. everybody loved that game and they were doing all sorts of cool things and then it just stopped. And that's probably one of the biggest dangers of play of running a licensed game is that if you're okay running with just a few books, that's great. But I would never depend heavily on a continued output of of books because sometimes these contracts are signed for X number of books or whatever. Like like there's going to be a sunset date. Now there's a sunset date on most product lines, but I think that it's like a little more tenuous when we get into licensed products because it's not just the publisher who gets that to make that decision. It's also the yeah. license holder. Right. So uh, yep. that's uh, other things to think about uh, from a very like industrial perspective. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, Oh, and I'll say the last part of it. Right. So in a lot of cases, these games are a little more expensive. Yeah, um, because you're you're also paying for the licensing fee, at correct. least to some extent. Yeah. But from the publisher perspective, it also gives you access to the fan base of that oh, license. It's which is huge. It's very it's very advantageous for the publisher to do this, even if they have to charge a little bit more. If you have a hot property, it is likely you will move books. Right. Yeah. And and you will, you know, but you do often have to raise the price to cover the licensing fees on top of all of your other stuff. Right. Your standard production and profits and all of that. Yippers. Yeah. Cool. So let's go ahead and jump into our second question, um, which is old and obscure. Zercher from our forums asked, given that Senda and Phil are also game designer types, if you had your pick of an old school slash obscure game to work on and rewrite slash revive, which one or ones would you choose and why? So I, I, I mean, for me, this is pretty easy, right? Because I have many, many, many old games that I have yes. played. But, but you <laughs> actually, you youngin, hmm. your timeline starts at at um, third edition D anD D. Right, it's uh, right around two thousand one. <laughs> right, is where my my RPG timeline starts. Right, um, and and I will just say because we kind of chatted about this for a moment, like. I have played a lot of obscure games on She's a Super Geek, and some of them, if I were to pick them up or write them myself, I might write them a little bit differently, but there's no way that I'm going to comment on like these new games. They're all still great the way they are, so I'm just going to let Phil answer this one, because I think it's more appropriate to answer for old games. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to pick two because um because you didn't pick one, I will pick two games and we'll talk oh, about Oh, it's like it's like Panera. Yeah. So we'll do a pick two. <laughs> you, you pick two. You pick two. <laughs> I will take the French onion soup and the Cuban sandwich. Uh-huh. Um, all right. So um the first one is going to be no surprise if you know me, you will have no surprise at all. My first old obscure game that I would revive is Underground by Ray Wittinger. It is um, it is about a dystopian future where um, governments get access to superpower technology uh, and they create superpowered soldiers who they send off to fight battles. And the governments don't do it. They hire companies that create these soldiers and the companies go fight the wars. Uh, but it's a story about vets from these wars returning home and now they don't fit in anywhere because, like, how do you go get a normal job when you can stop a 20 millimeter round with your skin and can, and can carry a car, right? So, so it's about the story of these vets and the struggles that they face and the facts that, you know, they wind up turning to crime and they're living in, they're living in slums. And all of those things. And while all of that sounds amazing, this game also was the first game that I ever saw that had mechanics for how to improve your neighborhood. This is um, every. In- this is all my inspiration for Hydro Hackers. This was a game about. This was a game where you could create positive social change, and it's biting commentary. It had a very. It had a very um, satirical commentary on the military industrial complex of the late 80s and 90s combined with its ability to do social good uh, is absolutely a game that um, I would love uh, to bring back. And I don't know what system I would do it in. There's a masks hack that might be fun to do it with um, all the emotions because um, Mm. your mental... 
stability was actually a very big part of the game. That sounds um, delicious. Yeah, it was, um, it was such a great game. It's its mechanical system is, is very traditional. So, you know, it's like it would benefit from a more modern version. Sneezak and I years ago, uh, before we started encoded, right before we started encoded designs, made a, a fate hack of the game that was actually really playable that we ran a campaign in and we had a really good time running a campaign in it. But yeah, that would be my first choice. I I just adore, like I adore that game so much. The artwork is fantastic. It is one of them. Um, have I ever showed you this game? I'm not sure, but but we shouldn't do it on mics tonight. No, 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 no. I'm just thinking I'll throw a copy of it. I have two copies yeah, yeah, of the yeah, rule book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I should throw a copy of, of the rule book in because for 1992, the layout of this book is also like ridiculously really dope. And well, the artist for Aeon Flux did a whole bunch of the artwork. Oof. Yeah. This, yeah. This, 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 like everything about this game is special. I'm, oh my God, I want to, you know what? Now I just want to go like get it, read it and run it. <laughs> Every time we talk about it, that's what you say. I know. Oh, so I actually have one and it's not probably oh. that obscure. And it's also not even something that to revive because it's coming out really soon, which is Girl Genius is one of my favorite web comics. It's super duper good and awesome and got me into like cool steampunk mad science stuff. And they're like, we wrote a game and it's in GURPS. And I was like, I am sad that it is in GURPS <laughs> because I will not play it. And I love your setting and I want to play in your setting, but I will not play GURPS. So if you were going to rewrite this game? I would do that one in Fate, which is what made me think of it. Because I think yeah. Fate would actually be for the kind of like push through, make a thing happen stuff that happens in that comic series all the time. Like... Um, where it starts and she doesn't even like consciously know that she's doing things, but like she's doing them, like being able to toss dice in on that and make stuff happen when you want slash need it to narratively and having that economy going back and forth, I think would actually be like on point for that game. And that's the first game in a while that I haven't been like powered by the apocalypse. So I feel like Faye would be really good for that. I'm starting to wonder if I would do a um, year zero. You could do it zero. in Savage Worlds. Sorry, well, you could do it in Savage Worlds, but I like Faye better for it mm -hmm. sorry year zero yeah no i was just i was just thinking that maybe like a like a year zero version of underground would be interesting like i was thinking like i don't want to do a pbta version because like you could but like right it we could make other things yeah i mean oh I, oh uh, oh forged in the dark <laughs> might be a really good he Make has a, really good a dreamy look in his eyes, looking off into the middle distance as he says it. <laughs> yeah, Forged in the Dark might be really good as well, because um, that handles stress and trauma and like getting stressed out and stuff during... Yeah. <laughs> he just did it again. The middle distance is calling oh, him. Oh, boy. <laughs> Stay away from that. All right. I was going to mention one other game. Uh, I'll mention it briefly for sake of time. I think we're doing... Are we doing okay? We're doing a yeah, little okay on time. We, we, we want to get one more in, um, so do it briefly. So the other one that I would um, that I would do is The Whispering Vault. This game is was originally written by Mike Nistel, who is uh, whose claim to fame is that he is a Nist Nistel's magic aura is a D&D &D spell. He's like one of the rare designers that uh, spell is named after the designer, not the designer's character. Wow. Like Tensor, Big Blee, like, you know, like all those guys, but mm -hmm. but Nistel's magical aura. Uh, anyway, um, it's a I, wa I, I want to it's kind of a horror game, but it's really like a horror superheroes game um, where you play supernatural bounty hunters that are tracking your quarry uh, into the real into the real world. It's a super evocative setting. The system's not so and the system's okay. Like it's play, it's serviceable. I think it'd probably make a decent one game or something. So, you know, I, I like I I would probably convert it to something like that. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's it's a neat game. Uh it's a neat game. It's good. It's really cool looking. Um it's pretty obscure. Uh I actually own an original I own an original copy of it as well as the um first publication of it by Pariah Press, but I own the one that Mike Nistel like handmade and like sold at Gen Con in like the nineties with wow. the with the comb with the comb back binding. Like it's not even a real 
Like it's not even a real binding. It's like the plastic comb. Oh, I got in it. I got in. I got in an auction at Gen Con. Like I. Yeah. Um, it's a keeper. Anyway, and it's got a badass symbol. I almost got a tattoo of that symbol. I was very close in the '90s of getting that symbol tattooed on my shoulder. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It was the 90s. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't mocking you. Ask the next question. The next question, our last one for this evening, uh, is all about spoons. Blake Ryan on Twitter asks, what about self-care, managing spoons slash mental health when it's you versus when it's another? Uh, there's a lot of gamers out there with anxiety and depression. I've had both. I have yeah. one and I sometimes get the other one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Me too. Uh, so let's talk about self care. Let's let's do first one to you. What um, what are some self care tips? Like, right, I mean, the first thing that I was going to throw out there because like this is one of those conversations that can get a little bit tricky. And the very first primary thing for you to remember is that while it's really important you have empathy for your fellow human beings and that we are doing no harm, right? There is a point at which you are only truly responsible for your own emotions and you cannot control the emotions of others and doing so and actually trying to manage someone else's emotions is dangerous and leads to codependency and occasionally abusive relationships okay so like let's just get that right out of the way up front because like when we're talking about managing other people's anxiety and depression we have to assume that we're talking about doing it in a healthy and controlled manner and not in the way that is like completely subsuming your personhood in the interest of managing someone else's emotions. Right. I I will say that really when it comes to other people, because most of us are not therapists or or trained in this in any way, that really what we're doing is providing support for somebody else, right? Yeah. We're not actually trying to fix anything. We're actually like not capable of diagnosing, like we're capable of being present. Yep. um, Listening, having empathy and giving support. Right. And, and, and not intentionally doing harm. Correct. Right. Or, you know, and, and being aware enough that we can unintentionally do harm. Right. right? And, like, and being aware enough to know when we have. Yeah. 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 So I, I okay. think it's... Im- that, I think, that, was, that was my preface. No, like, no. I think it's very important. <laughs> I think it's important to know, like, you cannot fix other people, right? Like, you can only support other people. And so if you are in, like you're saying, if you're in that place where you're trying to fix somebody, you are probably in the wrong place. Don't do it. Yeah. yeah. That's, it's not, you can't. Cool. So, so, so self-care. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm assuming, you know, in because this is the show that it is that we are talking about this in the context of gaming. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't no? know. Maybe we're just talking about I this mean, about humans. If, if we we're broaden, humans. I know. But if we broaden it out, it becomes very, very big, very quickly. So let me start in the context of gaming and it may bleed. Right. Because a lot of this stuff applies. So to me, self-care in gaming is using and having things like safety tools at your table, using lines and veils, communicating with the people around you about your needs and your emotional state and all of those things so that we can act on that to specifically take care of each other, right? So this applies to the greater world in in, in general because it's really about communication. Sure. I mean, to tack on to that, I would also say that you should not you should not use a game as a therapy tool unless you have gotten the consent of everyone else in the gaming group. Like do not yes. ambush a gaming group to work through a traumatic experience you had by um by doing it in the game without warning everyone else first, right? Like Right. It is I'm not going to say it's okay. I'm going to say that people do sometimes explore their traumas using a role-playing game. And the correct way to do that is to get everyone else on the table on board so that they can proactively watch for your safety. Right. Or sometimes you may even be just interested in playing something that it happens to brush up against yep. um, some stuff or has the potential to slip into that, right? So like in my um, in the last version of my Tales from the Loop game, which we fast forwarded into the 90s because we were impatient and couldn't wait for things from the flood. 
I ended up playing a character who was engaged to another character at the table. And he had the potential to be played very much like my ex-husband. And I was, but I was really interested in seeing, like, it was creating this super weird, tense, love triangle-y, like, nonsense. And it was, like, so good. And I was, like, really interested in the idea and the concept of having that um, weird relationship stuff have it happening at the table. But before we started that game, we had a pretty serious conversation about what could fall into that relationship um, and what couldn't, right? Mm-hmm. Like we had a very serious conversation about that. And to me, that was self-care because that was me um, both setting up some boundaries and like making sure that I wasn't going to accidentally use that as, you know, unintentional therapy in a way that might be traumatic to the people around me. <laughs> yes. Right. So that, that's my personal like game table example is like, but that's so that's a moment where we sat down and we actually and I was like, okay, I'm super interested in this. But here are the things that are off the table for me, because this will make this not a fun experience for me. And this will make it a spoon eating experience instead of a spoon giving experience. That whole game was extremely spoon giving. Part of the reason for that is because we had a lot of communication up front about that stuff. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, so self care, someone it's you and then when, it, when it's someone else. I mean, some of the same things apply. Uh, like, I do think, like, in terms of if we're talking about gaming and self care, I do think that having boundaries, like, limits to how long you're going to play. Yeah. Um, because sometimes people will sometimes try to escape into games, right? Like, I certainly did, like, escaped most of my childhood traumas by playing games. Yeah. But there are points where it becomes unhealthy. And so it's really important to watch for, it's really important to watch for, when somebody is, you know, diving into gaming too hard. Right. Right. Like and, ne- and, neglecting other parts of themselves. And, you know, it's still important to eat food and drink water and just basic things like that, which, you know, we can lose track of, honestly, at game conventions. Right. Like it's something that I have to pay extra special attention to and sleep. I, I sleep. will. I mean, as a cautionary tale, a good friend of mine 10 years ago or so went to their first large convention and had their first manic episode. Oof. And I saw them in between uh, in between sessions and they were very manic. And I originally was like, oh, yeah, that's what happens yeah, when you go to a convention. big con, yeah. you know, big con convention. But only to find out that later, like one, he had promised a whole bunch of things from being at the con and then two crashed. Oof. After the con, right? So there is a point of not overdoing it when you go to con spaces and things like that and not getting too revved up. And, you know, the thing I always say, right? Never do, never make a decision when you're too happy, too angry, or too sad, right? Yep. So if you're feeling super happy, even possibly manic at a con, like don't agree to run a hundred games or sign a contract or any of those things. The other part of this then would be to be very cognizant that con drop is real. Yeah, con drop is super real. Con drop is a thing. It's a thing you and I actually um, like make plans for. Like I purposely clear out my schedules the week after a con because there is a level of physical and then emotional uh, exhaustion that goes with having been so connected to your people uh, and then going back into the real world. Yeah, it's definitely a thing. Cool. So I think there's all, there's like way more we could talk about with that question, but I think we're going to keep it reasonably quick. Yes, because we are also not licensed therapists, and all the advice we're giving no, no. is completely just from our own uh, experiences. So yeah, it's yeah, safer yeah. for us to have dispensed some um, advice and now move on. Yeah. Before we close out this show, this grab bag episode, tell me about another show on the Mistracted Mark Network. Yeah, on Bonus Experience, Ray and Monica are two old friends exploring gameplay and design through the lens of diversity, while also sharing some of the dumbest humor gaming has to offer, including peanut butter and onion sandwiches, La Croix. Oh. Actually, I hear Bubbly is now the bubbly. one. Yes, Bubbly. Bubbly. Is, Bubbly's is winning, winning out. And Margaret and her mimosas. And there I got to go. do a, uh, a lovely uh, panel with them at Gauntlet Con um, about Podcasting 101, and they are fantastic. And we'll see them at Metatopia. Where we're gonna? Oh, we're not doing a uh, talk with them, are we? We're doing we're doing our talk with Rach, right? Yeah, we're doing our talk with Rach and James Malloy. Yo, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. Cool. If you um, want to reach us, want to give us a topic, 
for the grab bag because that's a thing you can do. Senda, where do people find us on the internet? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games and you can find us on the Misdirected Mark forums, which are misdirectedmark.com and there's a link up there, but or slash forums. Or is it forums? Whatever. I'll fix this in post. And if you join the forums now, you can still be entered in the competition for a little bit longer. There's a contest going on to get some f- awesome uh, handmade dice bags. If you like better, you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. And Phil, once they have connected with us in some way like that, what can they do with that information? Uh, as I just mentioned a few seconds ago, you can uh, send us your topics. We love to do shows about the things that you love or are curious about or just want to hear us uh, ruminate on. So send us your topics. We will find a way to get them into the show one way or another, or as my mom would say, by hook or by crook. Yeah, so please, please, please send us your topics um, and we'll get them onto the show. Now, if you like what we do here elsewhere on the Mr. Dr. Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaign. Patrons, you can go to Patreon. Patreon.com slash MMP. Patrons of the show get all sorts of good things. They get access to uh, the Slack room for life. Access to the bonus outtakes from this show. The after show from Mr. Director Mark. You can uh, occasionally get goodies from Encoded Designs uh, as we make stuffs. And, and sometimes, sometimes we make some other stuff. Right? Like sometimes like like show like song parodies and yeah, maybe our maybe our maybe our patrons could also like, you know, get your harp song now that the Sass Geek patrons got it first. Oh, I um, think I should release it to both. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Anyway, uh, the other thing we like to do is to shout out to our patrons. And so tonight, uh, Andy Olson, the Duke of Dice, thank you very much. Andrew Demps, thank you very much, and Ryan Bolter. They are fantastic. Indeed. Thank you. There's there's a thing that you can do if you are already supporting the Patreon campaign or unable to support the Patreon campaign that makes us very happy. It's pretty easy to do, and it involves a new app on my new iPhone oh boy. Uh, that says uh, Podcasts. Yes, well, that app has existed for a while. You just haven't had an app, uh, an iPhone. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so so what is that I've, thing you can do? I've been using that for a while. Um, you can leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Every new review we get really does actually help new people find the show, and it gives us a sense of artistic validation. So if you leave us a review, and it's not on the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, because it's really hard to check other places, please let us know, because we will go find it and read it and be super duper happy about it. It. And thank you so much to everyone who has already left a review. Awesome. Say, Senda, uh, show me how you would run a Steven Universe game. Yeah. That would be cool. Show me what you got. 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 This show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Show me what you got, hey, show me what you got, show me what you got, hey, show me what you got, show me what you got, hey, show me what you got, show me what you got, Bloop. Let it click. <laughs> waveforms, waveforms, let work? it click. Did <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Yeah. For you parents uh, who have kids who have Beyblades, you know that song. But for the rest of you, you probably don't. But Beyblades are I, like about the coolest kid's toy that uh, ever existed. Bloop. Let's have a dreamy moment. We're going to have a daydream. Ready? That's why I kept my harp here. Do they, te- do they teach you that? Like, is that a thing they teach you how to make the dreamy sound? That's like the easiest thing to do on a harp that requires no skill at, at like whatsoever. It just requires like a thumb. You say that, but I'm sure I could screw it up. I'm very sure that I could teach you how to do that. <laughs> I watched Joanna Newsom teach Larry King how to do that. <laughs> All right. Bloop. I need to not be speaking directly into the soundboard of my harp. Uh, yeah, that'll make some making weird, weird sounds. Yes, your yeah. your mouth instrument will... Yes, my mouth instrument will make weird sounds that my ear balls will pick up. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Bloop. Are you ready to dive into this? Yes. All righty, let's do it. Let's do it. Ready? Meow. Ow. I didn't bring any water down. Really oh, dehydrated. Oh, it's okay. Oh, Don't I, worry. I, okay. Bloop. Yes. <laughs> Q.
cue music. That's not how we get to a short episode. <laughs> I know. I just tried to say words, but I don't know what adjective to put in there now. I think you're the other playtesting host. Oh, okay. Well, good. Bloop. I know. I want like a sound of like one of those things, like the, you know. The, like a bag the, or? Well, no, like the thing you crank, like where they like oh, they pick no. out like the bingo balls and stuff. Like We were supposed <laughs> to do that at the end of the show. We used to do something with that. Right. Um, anyway. It? Oh, I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> it was like a hundred episodes ago. It used to be a thing. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. Okay, thirty nine forty three. <laughs> We're like just Oof. ready to Oof. like right to Oof. the wire. Oof. Oof. Okay. Okay. We're okay. gonna go, folks. We're gonna go. We're gonna go do the B show. We're gonna go do the B show. The B show. And uh, we'll catch you on the other side. So um, say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Stop.